And now, it's not just conflict that destroys people's homes. The climate crisis is also forcing thousands around the world to flee as their homes become uninhabitable. Our next guest is Abram Lestgarden, a Pulitzer Prize-winning environmental reporter. He spent years looking at how climate migration will reshape the world. Here he is talking with our Hari Srinivasan about his latest project. Biana, thanks. Abram, thanks for joining us. Um, I, I usually, you know, when I'm talking to friends and people are, we're having the conversation about how the world is constantly on the move, I, I usually say, you know, people are motivated by conflict, cash, or climate. And conflict and cash are pretty easy for people to understand. And you take a fascinating dive into how the world is already on the move and how that's going to get much more intense in the next few years, almost regardless of where you are on the planet. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, this is a project to look at migration related to climate change. And, you know, I think we talk so much about how the climate is changing in scientific terms or ec ecological terms, but not so much about how people experience that or how people will respond to that. Uh, and the fact is, you know, climate determines um, our comfort, it determines our water supply and our food supply. And those are the drivers that uh, lead people to uh, either stay where they live or to move. And uh, all of the predictors point to really significant large scale uh, movement of, of populations in, uh, in the future and, and beginning now. Along this trail, you basically uh, follow people as they're leaving, say, Guatemala and moving north. You're also finding how not just impoverished but hungry people are. You know, I went to Central America uh, with a real kind of analytical mindset. I thought that, that I would try to understand how migration would stem from climate change by getting into people's decision making. And I kind of expected, you know, we'd have this list of pros and cons and they'd be weighing this decision in a very rational or pragmatic way. And, uh, you know, and what I found was quite the opposite, that by the time uh, someone was thinking of actually moving, of, of uprooting their family or leaving their family and moving across borders, it was an act of, of sheer desperation. And it stemmed from just uh, absolute uh, hunger uh, and poverty. And, uh, you know, the communities in Guatemala, just like elsewhere in the world, are, are on the edge of famine. And, uh, and the potential for that famine in that region is explosive. And one of the traits that we learn from the United Nations and others who study uh, climate-driven migration is that uh, it's not usually a choice and it's not usually a preference. It's usually a decision of, of last resort, that people prefer to stay close. They're attached to their communities. And when they move, uh, it's because they have absolutely no other choice. Tell me a, a little bit about some of the people that you met along the way that were kind of the canaries in the coal mine, if you will, uh, of this trend that's happening in Central America, uh, Delmira de Jesus Cortez. So when I, uh, you know, when I met this woman in San Salvador uh, and, and learned her story, it didn't automatically sound like, uh, you know, she was a, you know, a person affected by climate. She had um, experienced a lot of violence. Uh, her husband had been killed uh, in a conflict with uh, local gangs. The Mara Salvatruca gang is extremely influential in San Salvador and across El Salvador. Um, that violence is normally attributed for, you know, to, to driving the, the migration that comes from that part of, of, uh, of uh, you know, Central America to the United States. But when you get a little bit deeper into her story, uh, find out that she, her life is also dramatically affected by changes in her climate. So she had come from a rural area uh, near the Guatemalan border in El Salvador. And uh, her family, uh, her parents uh, had worked as laborers in the coffee plantations that are there. And uh, climate had, uh, created a blight, a, a fungus disease that was affecting the coffee crops and coffee could no longer be grown. And um, the, the origins of their poverty stemmed from that change, which was directly tied to climate. Um, they then tried to expand their farming and grow different crops, but there's a shortage of water linked to drought, linked to changing El Nino patterns, change, linked to climate. Um, and those are the things that led her to migrate from her rural area into San Salvador, where she then, you know, fell prey to that gang, gang violence and deeper into poverty. Um, and so it was, you know, this sort of exercise of, of learning to look, you know, beneath the, you know, beneath the layers of the various things that had influenced her situation. Um, to understand that, you know, climate and environmental change was as much a driving factor in her life experience and her desire to, uh, to migrate to the United States as, uh, as was the violence and the things that we typically, you know, attribute um, pressures on the U.S. border uh, uh, to. What kind of numbers are we talking here? I mean, paint that picture for us in, in, in why people are so 
pressured to leave? So our modeling suggested, you know, about a million uh, migrants driven, influenced at least in some way by climate out of, uh, out of Central America towards the United States each year. Uh, it sounds like an extraordinary number, but it's actually close to the number of uh, migrants we see on the border um, now. It's a little bit greater than the pressures that we see now. But what's significant is to imagine that continuing, potentially growing consistently over the next 30 years. So your cumulative impact is you know, 30 million or so people um, moving to the United States. Globally, the estimates for the number of people that will be displaced by climate uh, are extraordinary and they're growing. So, you know, the United Nations counts um, about 30 million displaced people in 2020 alone. The World Bank estimates about 150 million people will be displaced by climate within their countries by 2050. But those numbers seem extraordinarily low. Uh, in our analysis, we worked with researchers who had published a study in, uh, last year in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that essentially suggest that one third of the planet's population will be faced with this decision of, you know, of whether to move and where to go. That study looked at um, you know, where humanity has existed for the past 6,000 years and found that we people uh, live in a relatively narrow band of uh, environmental conditions and that that band is, is moving for the first time you know, in those uh, millennium. And as that happens, about uh, 2 billion of today's people, 3 billion of you know, the population in 2070 will live outside of that zone in places that you know, we would have described as unlivable. Doesn't mean that they'll all move, but um, it's very likely that a large number of them will move. So we're really talking about you know uh, uh, population change on the order of billions of people. There are massive ripple effects on the geopolitical scale. So let's just say stay with Central America for a second. If people uproot themselves because they have no access to food or work, and they start moving north, even before they get to the U.S. border, all the countries along the way. Are going to feel this yeah so i mean movement of populations is just plain unsettling uh you know and i looked at this process of the, the they call it the you know stepwise migration uh, so people move out of rural areas they move first to cities then they later decide to move across borders and maybe their eyes in that movement are on making it all the way to the united states maybe it's just the goal of making it somewhere else and maybe that somewhere else is mexico and uh, as a part of my reporting, we spent significant time in southern Mexico just looking at what was happening in their communities as uh, thousands and tens of thousands of migrants transited through that region. And uh, it was really a case study in, uh, you know, in an extraordinary transformation. Mexican people were, uh, you know, I think at heart and philosophically uh, sympathetic to, to migrants uh, and their goals. And that changed so quickly as those people weighed on local communities and it changed the, what the infrastructure could handle in terms of waste. It changed what was available for food supply. Uh, crime rates went up. Um, there are all sorts of pressures that just come with a, a large and transient population. And that's kind of typical. Uh, and you see that around the world that the movement of people is unsettling uh, before they even get to their destinations. And then, of course, it, you know, it can be very unsettling, um, you know, if not carefully planned for uh, at the, you know, at the end point of, of those journeys as well. And we see that, you know, today on, on the southern U.S. border. So should this factor into when we think of climate policy, should we be also thinking of immigration policy or national security as part of this formula? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the lesson that I take away from my reporting on climate in general and migration specifically is that it all relates to, to one another and, and it has to be seen in sort of this braided fashion. Uh, and I think you're starting to see some of that, you know, in, in the Biden administration's approach to, to what's happening on the border now as well, where, you know, it's a very sticky and complicated issue to to decide what happens with, uh, you know, with uh, immigrants at the U.S. border. But they're but they recognize the importance of a, you know, a, a multi pronged approach where there's an increase in aid investment in things that might, for example, help food production uh, down in, in southern you know, in Guatemala. And so, you know, that's just one small example of, uh, you know, of the way that you can start to see these things intertwined. But I think going forward, you know, climate's a part of defense policy. It's a part of immigration policy. It's a part of trade. It's a part of uh, just about everything. Part two of your series was interesting in the sense that most Americans don't think that climate migration would actually happen here inside this country. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand why Central Americans would want to move up because they're closer to the equator, et cetera. But you lay out in painstaking detail how this is happening. And you really let's start talking first about the state that you're in right now, California. 
Yeah, I mean, I live uh, just north of San Francisco, and um, you know, we've had uh, really consequential wildfire seasons the last three or four years in a row. Uh, it's gotten significantly worse, um, among many other climate pressures that you know that our community faces. But um, you know, it's a it's a real threat that I lived through, and it was a subtle threat that I thought about as I was you know working on this project early on, and. Uh, as my project cycle turned a year and I went through my second uh, fire season while uh, while writing it, um, you know, I found myself uh, faced with the the possibility of evacuating, uh, faced with that decision making of, you know, is California the right place for me to live? Uh, should I should I be, you know, looking to head elsewhere uh, in the United States? Um, and where would that be? And and realizing that that decision making process was really little different from, you know, the farmers that I had was spending time with in rural parts of Guatemala. Um, situation, you know, obviously in the United States is so much less extreme. Um, our privilege, my privilege, is so much greater than that but there's a parallel and and what you know what the common thread is is that the changing environment is changing our decisions relative to our circumstances about where we live and if you look at the specific physical climate threats that the United States will face. Again, they won't be as severe as other parts of the world, but they're significant for us here. And uh, if you map those threats, which is what uh, we did as a part of my project, and you look at sea level rise coming from the coasts and uh, hurricane pressures uh, you know, along the Gulf and the East Coast and uh, the wildfires in the West and so on, um, the places across the country that are left untouched or suggested are you know, least, least at risk are really relatively small. And uh, you can start to see the potential for really a significant change in where Americans live and shifting the population. And you look a little bit deeper and start peeling back the layers of, of that issue and you see that people are already moving. Uh, the numbers are small-ish, but they're, they're getting bigger. There's also an increased urbanization in on these projections that big cities are gonna get bigger. So this is a pattern that, that we see worldwide uh, and, and is going to characterize the change that we see in the United States as well. Uh, people move out of rural areas and towards cities uh, and, uh, and seek the services that those cities can provide. And I think that you know, what's beginning to happen in the United States and, and what I see you know, happening over the next couple of decades is that um, rural areas or even small communities, small municipalities, you know, will not have uh, everything from, you know, the the capital, the tax base that they need, the the uh, human capital and expertise to guide transition, to build resilience, to invest in, uh, you know, mitigation measures um, that are going to be required to, you know, to confront the change that they face. And, um, you know, as that happens, people will increasingly find those services um, in concentrated areas, which which mean big cities. You, know, you point out in the piece uh, acutely that there will be projected water shortages west of Missouri. And on the other hand, there will be too much water along the coasts. I mean, it, <laughs> we have to kind of find the sort of a Goldilocks zone where uh, there's enough water to drink. And at the same time, it's not drowning us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, water is fascinating, and uh, in in terms of climate change, both for you know the scarcity that we will all face in terms of fresh water and uh, you know usable water for for drinking, for example, but. Um, also, the way in which climate change will, you know, not just bring sort of what everybody thinks of as, you know, heat and drought, but uh, will bring greater extremes. Uh, you know, we talk about these mega rain events in, in uh, you know, in the northern parts of the Midwest that have been just increasing in frequency the last couple of years. Um, they've led the lake levels of the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, to rise, uh, you know, about a foot a year, faster than sea level rise on the on the coasts. And all of our focus goes to, you know, sea level rise as, uh, you know, the ice caps melt, um, but we have, you know, lake level rise, uh, you know, that's just as, as significant. Uh, you know, I think the bottom line is that um, the climate's going to change everywhere. Uh, you know, Americans and, the, and people around the world are going to need to figure out how to mitigate that where they can, retreat where they need to, and, uh, you know, and adapt to those changing circumstances. And, uh, you know, it's going to be on a sliding scale where in some places adaptation might mean that a place becomes unlivable and you have to move. Um, you know, maybe I don't want to live in, you know, a wildfire zone, but in other places, uh, you know, adaptation might mean a much more subtle adjustment. Um, but but few places will, will be untouched. When we look at policies, I mean, the U.S. refused to join 164 other countries in signing a migration uh, treaty in 2018. Uh, at the same time, the U.S. has cut back on aid that would help some of the families who are struggling right now. So what should the Biden administration do? 
I mean, I, you know, I think the lesson for me through all this research is that the, you know, the more that's done in a very multifaceted and diverse way and the faster that it's done, uh, the better. So I guess what that means is they should do everything and do it quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, my bias, which, we, you know, is a result of our modeling and, and extraordinary amount of research is that, uh, you know, more open borders, uh, more receptive policies uh, have a positive net result. They improve, uh, you know, security and stability for the United States or for, you know, developed countries, and they improve the livelihoods and stability of, of origin countries. And I mean, you can see that in, in a number of examples. I mean, Syria is one that comes up frequently where, you know, there's, there's roots to the Syrian conflict, uh, you know, a decade ago in this same environmental change where you, you know, you saw, you know, pastoral communities having a difficult time raising their animals and and so they rapidly urbanized and that urbanization led to pressures that led to, uh, you know, or at least contributed to, you know, the uprising there. Um, nations faced a decision then, uh, Europe, about, you know, what kind of aid to provide and how to, you know, help address the drought that Syrians were facing and they chose not to. Um, you know, I think that's a cautionary tale uh, for what we do going forward. And, um, you know, so, so again, that foreign aid is an option and, and I'd like to see, you know, our administration and, and modern administrations, you know, take that route, um, you know, and, uh, and you do know, pragmatic, uh, manageable, uh, controlled, but open border policies, I think, are, you know, are, are necessary to allow a sort of healthy flow around the world. I mean, after all, like, you know, migrations always happen and it always will. And in a sense, it's a very natural uh, adaptation to uh, our environments around us. And, um, you know, borders are a modern construct that, um, you know, prohibit that from happening. Abraham Losgarden, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for your interest. I appreciate it.